Well, shalom and welcome to the week four. Before we get started on our on our study, I'd like you to join with me for uh, thanking Abba for the food we have we've eaten. Abba, we've eaten and we're satisfied. We thank you for the land. It's in Yeshua's name. Amen. So again, we are doing um, Hebrews chapters one through three. And here's a, uh, to go through a bit of an overview, here's a picture of a text from the Munster Hebrew uh -huh. text of Matthew, but it looks, couldn't find one for, for the book of Hebrews, but there is a, <laughs> there is a Hebrew text of, of Hebrews. So kind of as an overview, I'll say that the book of Hebrews is, is a challenging book, uh, doctrinally speaking, I would say, for Messianics, uh, particularly when we get to chapters 7 through 10, and so we'll spend some time going into uh, into the, some details on that. But I think that understanding Hebrews is an important uh, important to understanding, you know, in some ways, the way ahead, the will of Adonai, as well as the insight into Yah's plan. Uh, as uh, as many of you know, it's it's authenticity as uh, as part of the Bible has been challenged um, years back, but uh, by Messianic leaders. And since we are believers in Yeshua and that his uh, revelation to us, we want to ensure that we are studying authentic, authentic, authentic scriptures. We're going to take a look at over the course of the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, whether the book of Hebrews lines up or contradicts uh, the Torah and the Tanakh. And so we'll be able to examine those challenges and confirm or deny whether Hebrews is, is scripture. So we're going to look at who wrote the book of Hebrews as well as what that means to whether it's accepted as scripture. We'll also look at some of the things about the original language of, of Hebrews. And so that there's also an, an interesting part that talks about the Torah being spoken by angels out on Mount Sinai. And we'll examine how that lines up with Torah, the Ketuvim Netzarim, as well as even extra biblical writings on this, on this issue. So begin with that, let's look at Psalm 19. That the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Yahweh, my rock and my redeemer. So starting with the authorship question, who wrote the book of, of Hebrews? There are a number of possibilities that are proposed. Paul or Shaul, Apollos, Barnabas, um, Priscilla and Aquila, sometimes just Priscilla alone, Prisca alone, as well as anonymous, that is written anonymously. And we see that it's certainly anonymous in the uh, in the Torah, correction, in the in the Ketuvim Nesarim. There's no author listed in that uh, in the preview of that of that book. So here's a a section about Origen as being uh, as writing on the subject. He says. Throughout Origen's writings, he quotes from the Epistle to the Hebrews more than 200 times. and the vast majority of his references, he is content to attribute it to Paul as his author. But near the close of his life, around 245 CE, he died around 253 CE, where Origen is speaking as a scholar, he admits that the tradition of its authorship is wholly uncertain. And in that, in that sense, if you were to, to probably, if you were to poll most most people who, uh, you know, most scholars, if you will, who, who study the book today would argue or would hold the position rather that the, it's, it's anonymous, it, it, that it's, it's anonymous and it wasn't something that can be confirmed as one of Paul's writings. So the uh, origin as quoted by Eusebius. I should say that the thoughts are the apostles, but that the style and composition belong to one who called it, who called to mind the apostles' teachings, as it were, made short notes of what his master said. If any assembles his epistle as Paul's, let, be, let it be commended for this also. So again, this is origin, but quoted by Eusebius, who wrote later. Much of Origen's writings are only preserved by Eusebius, not by things that he wrote himself. But quoted uh, by by others. In the next 
generation or so later. For not without reason have the men of old handed it down as Paul's, but who wrote the epistle? In truth, God knows. And that again is uh, kind of near the end of Origen's life, writing this. Yet the account which has reached us is twofold. Some saying that Clement, who is bishop of the Romans, wrote the epistle. Others that it was Luke, who also he who wrote the gospel and the book of Acts. So according to the Roman historian Eusebius, Clement of Alexandria taught that Paul wrote Hebrews in the Hebrew language and, and that Luke was and Luke then translated it into Greek. So again, Eusebius was quoting Origen earlier. This, this is his view now regarding what Clement, not his view, but quoting another another source, Clement of Alexandria, who, uh, who said he says that Paul wrote it in Hebrew. To, uh, and Luke then translated it into Greek. So this is a this is from a commentator, a um, modern scholar, John McKee, J.K. McKee. He writes, the epistle to the Evilim, or the Hebrews, was written somewhere sometime before 70 of the Common Era, as it speaks of the temple in Jerusalem still standing. The authorship of Hebrews has been debated. Many believe that Shaul or Apollos wrote it, while others believe it was Bar Barnabas or Apollos, Silas, Priscilla, or even Clement of Rome. Regardless of who wrote Hebrews, the author had an, an excellent knowledge of the Hebrew Tanakh and of the good news of Messiah Yeshua. If, if, if Shaul or Paul did not write Hebrews, then it is likely that one of the, his close associates did. Again, that's a, a modern uh, opinion, Messianic uh, scholar opinion. Here's what uh, J. Vernon McGee, you uh, may remember him. He's a, a commentator, a Bible um teacher from years ago in the years ago by i mean uh, 20th century late 20th century in the early church were three traditions growing the authorship of hebrews the alexandrian tradition supported pauline authorship the african tradition supported the authorship of barnabas rome and the west supported the idea that it was anonymous uh, not mentioned above by Vernon mcgee but there's also a fourth tradition from the church of the east and Aramaic traditions that were would be said was said that Paul wrote the book of uh, book of Hebrews. So Alexander tradition was was the same as the <clears throat> Church of the East Aramaic traditions in that sense. So what are some arguments against authorship by Paul? Well, the first one, usually the one that's heard first, is the text in blue on the slide that says. Uh, the, the whole uh, verse reads, this is from King James, How shall we escape if we neglect to great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by them that heard him? So it kind of gives the impression that the author of Hebrews didn't hear uh, Yeshua. And in a sense, that's, that could be Paul as well, in my view, though, because he... You know, Paul wasn't present for Yeshua's earthly ministry. He was present. He, you know, he heard the voice on the road to Damascus. So you can look at it either way. This is usually a, a, an argument against Paul's authorship. Usually, usually seen as an argument against. First Corinthians and others of, of Paul's writings begin something like Paul, a called one, and an emissary. By Yeshua the Messiah, and then continues to the assembly of. So, if Paul wrote Hebrews, why doesn't he use his usual form of, of address, like he used here as example from First Corinthians? Paul called it called a uh, an emissary or a shliach. So that'd be a that's a question that's an argument against uh, Pauline authorship of of Hebrews. Yeah, because every every other else everything else has that long standard reading. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. One of the, I guess, responses you could argue uh, for this, there is a an elder named Pantanus who, quote, taught that since the Lord, meaning Yeshua there, being the apostle of the Hebrews, was sent to the Hebrews, Paul, through modesty, since he had been sent to the Gentiles, does not inscribe himself as an apostle to the Hebrews, both to give due deference to the Lord as in Yeshua and because he wrote to the Hebrews also out of his abundance, being a preacher and apostle of the Gentiles. A, um, a later commentator, John Owen, 
uh, added that he said that the apostle to the Gentiles and knowing of his Jewish discrimination against him wanted to avoid any Jewish prejudice against his letter to the Hebrews was like it would have been the case if they knew that it was Paul himself that wrote it. That's you know a, a later thought, but it's a I think it's a well-reasoned thought in that sense. So from an Aramaic uh, perspective about who wrote it, it's a there's a listing, the earliest Aramaic manuscripts of Paul's letter to, or this letter to uh, to the Hebrews says the end of the letter to the Hebrews which is written from Italy of Rome and was sent by the hands of Timothy. And then the, the comment uh, is that Timothy was known to deliver manuscripts for Shaul alone. Timothy would not be acting as a courier for either Barnabas or Luke. So again, this is early ancient, early Aramaic manuscripts of the letter say that it was written from Italy of Rome and sent by the hands of Timothy. But the idea is that it was a letter from Paul that was written and it would only be Timothy that would be hand carrying it for Paul. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, before we go to others, I mean, before we go to other subjects, any discussion about um, authorship of Hebrews that you've heard from, uh, from other sources or in your studies this past week? So where you said that that logic makes sense, I don't know. If somebody came and read a letter to me, I would want to know who wrote it and say, oh, it's an anonymous letter. Well, then it doesn't carry a lot of weight with me. So if he wasn't going to be accepted, if he wrote to the congregation in Jerusalem or whatever it was, then why did he even bother to write it? if people were going to reject it, if it was under his name. If he had, if he was like a ghostwriter for somebody else and they presented it as, you know, here, this letter is from Barnabas or whatever. Um, does that get more acceptance just because really it was written by somebody else, but he was it sent under somebody else's name? So I'm not, I'm not real comfortable with the idea that he would have not put his name on it so that people would read it and accept it. Hmm. Well, if if it was important enough to be written and you're the only one that could write it, and you but but if it was sent by you, it'd be rejected because of your reputation with that community, then that seems to me that'd be a way to get past that is to not sign your name to it. But that is one of the arguments against Pauline authorship. Of, but of people it. reading it then would or would want to know, well, who says, you know, or as we say, says who. Mm -hmm. Right. So. <laughs> oh. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. We'll do. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Yep. Sorry. That was uh, Mrs. Ingalls. So then, as far as it goes for the writing <coughs> style, um, some of it maybe would be reminiscent of Matit Yahoo. Something. Well, they, well, when we get to the language part of it, people will make comparisons really in the, of the Greek of it to the Greek of Luke. That's where some of the, at least where I've seen that the, the New Testament scholars that talk about it in the Greek text look at it as being a very highly polished uh, letter above the standard of Greek use that in, in Paul's previous letters and they compare it to the, the good Greek of, of Luke's gospel as well as the book of Acts. But could that have been the fault of the translator? Well, it, I guess it depends. Well, we'll talk about it. I mean, let, let's let's hold that to get done with the, the the language part of it and then see if that see if that question's answered or or if it makes sense 
to you what I'm what it says there. So, so next section of it is is original language. The arguments for a Greek original is that Hebrew Hebrews is widely recognized by scholars as actually having some of the highest Greek composition of the New Testament, the continuing next stream. The author of Hebrews writes Greek quote writes Greek with a purity of style and vocabulary. Of course, the writings of Luke alone in the New, in the New Testament can be compared. So that's a general, general statement about the, the quality of the Greek uh, writing of the book of Hebrews. The, another argument for a Greek original is in the Greek, uh, new, uh, the, the Greek text of uh, Hebrews ha has 32 direct quotations from the Tanakh, and only four of those are not explicitly quoted from, from the Septuagint. So meaning that the Septuagint was the source of the quotes from the Tanakh, meaning that it was from one Greek source to another would be the way that I think that would be argued. In other words, it wasn't a it wasn't someone translating their own, you know, the text of the Hebrew Tanakh into Greek. It's a, essentially a direct quotation from the style and language of the Greek Septuagint text. So those are a couple of points for the Greek original, or a Greek original for that. One of the arguments for an Aramaic original would be a split word, something that's not quite the same. It's, it's not as, as blatant in terms of the differences in the Greek uh, word in Hebrews 8.11. So if you look at Hebrews 8.11, it's, let's uh, take a quick look at that. If you have your, if you have your Bibles, you can open it to Hebrews 8, 11, see how yours may read differently from this, but. It's the first section of, of this text it says, and they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen would be a way of looking at it. We'll see how that, that plays out here in just a minute. But the in terms of the Greek words used there, fellow citizen is found in the Alexandrian text, whereas neighbor is found in Textus Receptus text. I have a quote on the next slide that talks about that term. So the, where does this, this, uh, this text comes from, of course, is you know, reading from, uh, well, it's the, it's the, it's the, the section Jeremiah that talks about the, uh, the new covenant in Jeremiah. Uh, and this one, the word used there for, in the Hebrew text of Hebrews, we'll talk about in just a minute, is uh, Rehu, which of course means his neighbor, which is exactly the same as in the, uh, the actual text of, of Jeremiah. But so there's there are some similarities, polyton versus polyon, for the the Greek words there. So they're similar, but they're they're different enough that it'd be hard to make a copyist error of missing whole you know several letters in that from from this. Um, so one says citizen, one says neighbor. The Aramaic text says labar medintha, which would be son of his city or son of his town, which could be interpreted either as a neighbor or in some ways as a as a citizen. So that's a potential split word from Hebrews 8.11 from the Aramaic text. This is looking at it, at it from a, this is from um, Bruce Terry's Student's Guide to New Testament Variants. And he, he shows the versions that have fellow citizen and the vers versions that have neighbor. And in, in other words, in his view, the comments, although it is possible that copyists change the word neighbor to fellow citizen, so it would be read like the passage in the Greek Old Testament from which is quoted, it is also possible that the more common word neighbor was substituted for fellow citizen. As you see, in terms of the number of texts that have neighbor, it's far fewer than those that have fellow citizen. Although the and that's basically kind of the bottom line for that. Most of the Latin Vulgate is, is part is neighbor, but only a few of the Greek manuscripts are neighbor. But it is part of it's part of the Texas Receptus had it as 
um, neighbor. You see that from the, when you're look, reading it from a, a, a King James. Anyway, that's an argument for the Aramaic text of that. Another is that the quotations from some of the church fathers, Origen, Ambrose, and Jerome, each quote a phrase that is unique to the Eastern Peshitta text, min satar Eloha, apart from Elohim, that doesn't exist in either the Western Aramaic text nor in the Greek manuscripts. And if you look in in your in your Bibles, it'd be in Hebrews 2, 9 is the verse being uh, referenced. And the phrase appears at the end of at the end of the uh, the uh, the text it's it, it's kind of the slide's kind of busy here but the the way it reads in you know a translation from the Hebrews 2 9 of the Eastern Peshitta would be but now he is crowned with honor and glory because he takes a death for the sake of everyone whereas in the Western Aramaic text Peshito it has a, it substitutes uh Betobata, in, in place of mean satar. And batobata is a word that would translate by the grace of, of uh, God, grace of Elohim. And so the, the interesting thing is that Origen, Jerome, and Ambrose would have been writing, in, in one case, see, uh, Jerome would have been also working in Latin Vulgate. He's a translator of that. But they've been writing in Greek. In, in Greek. And so they're writing in Greek in a text or in a phrase quoting this verse that is not in any Greek manuscripts, which is kind of odd. In other words, they're quoting from, at least in current source, there are no Greek manuscripts that read apart from Elohim at the end of Hebrews 2.9. They read the same as the Western Peshitta does. Uh, instead, of by the, instead of apart from God, it'd be by the grace of God. So the way... You, know, you look at it in a, in a sense that this text originally read apart from Elohim, or else how did these non-Aramaic scholars, Origen, Ambrose, and Jerome, get a hold of a text that essentially quoted a, a Peshitta text that wasn't, and if, if it existed in the, you know, in the Greek-speaking uh, areas, it no longer does, and yet that's, they quoted this passage. So it kind of lends itself to the idea that an Aramaic original had the phrase min sitar elo, eloa, or apart from Elohim, in it that was uh, no longer in um, Greek text. And the next slide has a potential, you know, theory about the removal of that phrase. And it um, reads, possibly due to the monophysite belief that arose in the mid-2nd century in Alexandria, in popularity when the Byzantine text was emerging. The monophysite means one nature, and it's the belief that Yeshua existed, existed only as divine, but only and appeared to be human, but really wasn't. He was in reality was only divine, didn't have a human nature and a divine nature, he was only human, hence the word mono, monophysite. Okay. So a counter argument to Luke's Greek uh, being, you know, Luke's good Greek argument is really taken from what we've read already. It's the end, it's the marking at the end of the uh, the early manuscripts that says that it was written from, from Italy of Rome and was sent by the hands of Timothy. Well, we know that Paul was in Rome near the end of his life. Obviously, he was executed there. But, and so if Timothy would be, delivering manuscripts for only Paul and not Luke or Barnabas. They are make manuscripts state that Luke transported the letter, so that he definitely could have been the one who translated it as well. And if, if the comparison is between Luke's Greek of his gospel and the book of Acts and the Greek of the book of Hebrews, then that's well with the idea that Luke, in fact, was the one who translated it from, in this case, the, the argument would be from the Aramaic counter-argument because that's where it appears uh, on the at the end of manuscripts. So that'd be, you know, kind of a, a counter-argument to the idea that Luke's good Greek means it was really, really written in Greek. When Luke, according to Aramaic tradition, Luke was the 
messenger. He was a transporter of that document. He well, he could have well, well, he had the original in his possession. He could have translated it out of the original language, whether there's Aramaic or um, Aramaic or Hebrew, into good Greek as well. Thing now, arguments for a Hebrew original. Now, there's a there's a Munster Hebrew text of the Book of Hebrews that was found in in the Middle Ages, early Middle Ages, <clears throat> and so there's not a an ancient document of the Book of Hebrews, but there is a, a document that could potentially be a copy of an ancient document of the Book of Hebrews, and so looking at one of the what some of the you know, if you want to call them that, the Church Fathers, Clement of Alexander, for one, writing about the year 200. He, uh, as quote, he says that Hebrews was written by Paul to the Hebrews in the Hebrew tongue, but it was carefully translated by Luke and published among the Greeks. We've already seen one of the, this uh, before, it's previous. Teeing on Eusebius, we've talked about him before. He says that as Paul had addressed the Hebrews in the language of his country, some say that the evangelist, evangelist Luke, others that Clement translated the epistle. So according to Eusebius, whether it was Luke or Clement, they translated it from, quote, the language of his country, which could also be considered to be evidence for an Aramaic original, given that we, we read in the book of Acts that the language of the people of Jerusalem was, in fact, Aramaic. And Jerome, well, text doesn't look real, real great here, but Jerome wrote that he, Paul being a Hebrew, wrote in Hebrew, that is his own tongue, and most fluently, while things which were eloquently written in Hebrew were more eloquently turned into Greek. We'll talk, we'll talk a little bit more about this in this in this section, but we'll talk more about differences in the Hebrew and Aramaic texts of Hebrews when we get to those critical chapters of 7, 8, 9, and 10. That's my intent at least. So questions on this before we go to Hebrews chapter 1. Did that? Well, so I'll go ahead and ask again. Mm -hmm. um, if the person who eventually recorded this Peshitta version of it and added this footnote that it was transmitted by the hand of Timothy mm -hmm. from Rome, why would that person not have known who the author was and why would they have neglected to mention like who wrote it and instead just listed who carried it? Well, it is possible. I mean, consider the possibility that they did know uh, the author was known at the time and for whatever reason, maybe a cover page or something is lost from it. We just, we simply just don't have it. It is quite possible that they did know who wrote it and the recipient knew exactly who it was coming from possible so like we sometimes call this chain of custody <clears throat> like you want to know who had it and then who had it in between and you want to make sure you trust sure. everybody along the chain of custody so that you can figure that it wasn't like altered sure so to me that would be important information like if i received the letter i would want to know who wrote it who handled it in between um before it came to me Sure. Because if I don't trust the chain of delivery there, then the content is suspect. Right. But I think the fact that it survived and is part of the canon is testimony to to the chain of custody, if you will, that it was quite possibly known at the time. And it but was somehow to somebody to write that down, too. Yeah, yeah. So it's, at, at some point in history, it just got lost. We just don't have it. Well, maybe that's yet to be discovered and maybe some lost part of the transcript somewhere. Well, the, the, the tradition within the Aramaic speaking community or churches was that the assemblies in, in those Aramaic speaking countries was that it was Paul that wrote it. And they hated him. No, right. no, no, I don't think so. What you're saying? No, I'm not saying that at all. Uh, they did. Sounds like that's just, I'm <laughs> they didn't hate him. Is there a tradition that he yeah, wrote it? See, this is how things get lost in history. <laughs> <laughs> that was the internet, <laughs> right? So it's possible. I mean, I, I think your concern is is well founded. 
Well, this is one of the reasons why it was argued about whether it should be in the canon at all because of not knowing who, who wrote it. And the tradition that Paul wrote it was strong enough, at least at the time, I think, to get it into the canon without Paul's backing. I mean, some have argued that just because of the nature of what's in it, it was strong enough by what's in it alone to get into the canon of Scripture sure. because of what's what in it, what's in it, not by the authorship of it. But I think that realistically, if you don't know who wrote it, it's suspect of what authority do they have to tell you these things. You know, that's right. And the, the argument, you could, the, the counter argument would be, well, they, it's not their authority that's making it. They're just pointing to you what the other scriptures say and draw your conclusions from what the other scriptures say, not what I say. I'm just making the argument from that, but it's the scriptures that back me up. So you can make a Berean argument as well, saying that, well, it doesn't really matter who wrote it because the text tells us what's the important things. It's not it's not the author we're listening to, but it's the quotations from this knock that paint this picture of why you know Yeshua is who he says he is and why this why this is important. We didn't understand uh, Yeshua in context with the Tanakh. Anyway, that's that's a thought on it. So again. The authorship is is disputed. It is unknown. And that's part of the reason, I think, why it was in modern times, it was argued that it shouldn't be in the canon, according to at least some, uh, you know, some messianic uh, views on that. So next up is Hebrews chapter 1. And this is not the first verse of that, but it's the word, it's the, the passage that talks about, you are my son, today I have begotten thee. We've gotten you. And that is actually a quotation from Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. And the commentary text notes from, this is from the, um, the PME, the Practical Messianic Edition of the Scriptures. The text note is tells you what the text says, and the whole, the whole text is 2-7. And this is, I will surely tell of the decree of Yahweh. He said to me, you are my son today. I have begotten you. And that's the first quote from that. Continuing on, kind of this uh, slide builds. Uh, uh, before, before I build, let's go back to begotten. So the, the word there, you, you can look at the word. What's, what do you think is the root word of begotten? Well, it's the first three letters. It's the Yud Lamed Dalit, which is Yaled, which you, was Yaled a child. So that's Yaled. the mm -hmm, Yaled, and this, so that's the that is the root word of of begotten. It doesn't necessarily mean well when you when you look at, for example, Devrim thirty two eighteen. If someone has that, I might. If you do, can you look that up for me? I, I don't have it. In my I don't have anything up. My my other Bible's over there. I need to grab that probably. Um, it's Devarim thirty two eighteen. It's a it's not this, this exact same word form as this, but it's usually translated the same as begotten in English translations. You ignored the rock who fathered you. You forgot Elohim. Gave you birth. So I think the gave you birth is the uh, the word there for um, that's translated from the word yeled. So the idea that the that Israel was fathered or given birth or begotten from Yah is where this where I was going with that. Hmm. Continuing on with the the second half of this passage when it says and again. Uh, <clears throat> Note C at the bottom there, as for quoting Second Samuel seven fourteen, I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the children of humanity. That is from Second Samuel, and now note D from that text as we build it is quoting or referencing First Chronicles seventeen thirteen. Which reads, I will be his father, and he will be my son, and I will not take my love and kindness away from him, as I took it from him who was before you. So each of these passages is building from, uh, you know, that, or that the author of Hebrews is building a, a case from these texts, these quotations from Psalms, from Second Samuel, from First Chronicles 17. 
And so this is a quote from Epiphanius, Panarian 30, which reads, the gospel according to the Ebionites had the voice from heaven at Yeshua's immersion, citing this passage saying, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased, and again, this day I have begotten you. So that's not the canonical gospel of, of to Matthew, but it's another gospel similar to Matthew called the gospel according to the Ebionites. There's another, there's another text out there that's quoted from called the gospel of the Hebrews. And this is kind of related to that one. But it has a quote in it that is very similar to this passage we read here in the, the book of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5. The Talmud acknowledges that ch uh, chapter uh, Psalm 2-7 is a messianic prophecy and reads this way. It says, this is from Sukkah 52a. The Holy One, blessed be he, will say to the Messiah, the son of David, ask of me anything and I will give it to you. As it is stated, I'll surely tell of the decree of, I'm, I'm sure that the, the um, Talmud as here says probably, uh, Adonai, this day I have begotten you, ask of me, and I'll give you the nations as your inheritance. So these passages talk about the Messiah being being referenced in Psalm 2-7, just as the letter to the Hebrews also references Psalm 2-7 as being a messianic prophecy. Continuing on to Qumran. Qumran is, in this Text is holding chapter uh, two, Second Samuel two seven. I'm, I'm sorry, Second Samuel seven, as also being a messianic uh, text. It says, moreover, and probably says, says here Yud Yud in this text. I don't know. Declares to you that he will make you a whore, a house, and that I will raise up your offspring after you and establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be my son. That's quoting various sections of 2 Samuel chapter 7. And then the commentary from Qumran adds, this passage refers to the shoot of David. Of course, that would be the Messianic reference to Yeshua, in our view. I'm not sure the Qumran community believed that Yeshua was the Messiah, but they believe that shoot, the shoot of David is a Messianic prophecy. And this is from 4P 174 uh, in the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls text. So that's all I have for chapter one. Anybody have anything you'd like to discuss uh, from chapter one that didn't really cover? No, that's pretty good. We'll continue then to chapter two, Hebrews chapter two. Before we get to Hebrews two, I'm going to talk about a couple of these later on, the seven rules of Hillel. This is the first three of them. Uh, the first one is called Kal Vachomer, light and heavy. And we, we look at it as if X is true of Y, then how much more X must be true of Z? Because Y is greater than Z. Um, and the I'll just read the English text of it, the English equivalence of expressions, building of the father from one text is the third rule of seven of Hillel. Uh, the fourth is building of the father from two or more texts. The fifth is the general and the particular, and I'll read the, what it says here in terms of the definition. A general statement that is first made and is followed by a single remark which applies the general principle to a particular text. And then finally, six and seven, the analogy made for another <clears throat> passage and the explanation obtained from context. So the total context, not just the isolated statement, must be considered for accurate exegesis. Those are the seven rules of Hillel. And it's probable that Hillel wasn't the, he was the one who compiled it. He probably was not the original author of that, but it was certainly the, the rules of uh, scriptural interpretation that was named after him. So the first verse of chapter 2 reads, Because of this, we have to pay more attention to what we, what we have heard, lest we drift away. So this is the first of five exhortations in the book of Hebrews to not drift away through complacency and apathy or neglect. Now, what does it probably mean if there's an exhortation to not drift away? People are drifting away. I think there's a pretty good chance people are either going to or are, in fact, currently drifting away. So he has to say it, in this case, he says it five times uh, in this book. 
Verse 2, for if the word spoken through messengers proved to be firm and every transgression and disobedience received a right reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a deliverance which first began to be spoken by the master and was confirmed to us by those that heard? We talked about this in terms of an authorship question, but we look at the list is the light and the heavy methodology. If Messiah is of a higher grade than angels, and if the Torah was given by angels, then the words of Messiah must be at least as binding as the Torah. Again, that's, that is classic Kalva Homer uh, uh, hermeneutics. So a possible problem with this would be if Hebrews 2.2 2 is speaking of the Torah, either Elohim in the Masoretic text or the word in the Jerusalem Targum spoke fr from the mountain, unless Elohim in Exodus 2, 20 Verse 1 is a small e Elohim and means angel. So, so we read from the Masoretic text that it was Yahoo speaking, not angels. So that's a possible um, problem with uh, this uh, idea or understanding. And so we've, we've already talked about this argument against um, Pauline, argue, Pauline <coughs> authorship. And so what was, the, what was the argument against Pauline authorship here? Well, the first one is he didn't give you know, the greeting, the, the long greeting. First is greeting, but in this in this uh, text, it's the the phrase confirmed by those that That's, heard. That heard, mm -hmm. yeah. So it indicate that you know Paul wasn't you know Paul heard from the Messiah <clears throat> on the road to Damascus, but not didn't hear the word. Didn't hear, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. would apply to all the other ones we've. I think all the other possible um, authors, none of them would have heard either. In the sense, they were not part of either the twelve or the 70. So this idea of delivered through messengers. Now here's a quote from it. It's, it's the, uh, the Net Bible has a commentary. Net Bible commentary reads on this. The message spoken through angels refers to the, quote, Old Testament law, which according to Jewish tradition was mediated to Moses through angels. Again, talks about um, the, the sources for that include, uh, include jubilees as well as uh, Josephus. Mm -hmm. So again, Jewish tradition says it was uh, mediated to Moses through angels, through angelic messengers. And so here's some of those uh, passages. Jeremiah 33 2 says, uh, and he said, Yahweh came to Sinai and rose from Seir for them. He shone forth from Mount Paran and came with ten thousands of set apart ones and his right hand a law of fire for them. And Psalm 68 reads, the chariots of Elohim are 20,000, thousands of thousands. Yahweh yeah, came from Sinai into the set-apart place. You have ascended on high. You have led captivity a captive. You have received gifts among men and even the rebellious that Yah Elohim might dwell there. So angels are involved in these passages, one from the Torah, one from the book of Psalms. It doesn't say there's delivered through messengers in those. But here's what the Jerusalem Targum says. Uh, the Targum reads... Um, and the word of Maria spoke all the excellency or praise of these words, saying, uh, and this is what the Midrash says, 20, 22,000 angels descended with God on Sinai. The chariots of God are 20,000, thousands of Shanaan, often translated as angels, and the very best, the choicest, Shanaan, went down. So, again, the Midrash talks about angels descending with uh, Elohim at Sinai. And we see when you, when you go back a passage, it says that he came with 10,000s of set apart ones, endeavoring 33. And we see the chariots 20,000 according to Psalm 68. So putting these together, the idea uh, perhaps could be that the Torah was delivered through the angels, not the angels just merely accompanied uh, Yah, but actually were the method, uh, met the method that Yah used for transmitting the Torah to Moshe. Of course, the Targum says it was Yeshua. It says the word of Maria spoke. So here's some uh, passages that talk about messengers. What Acts, and these come from the New Testament, Acts 7.38 says, this is he who was in the assembly in the wilderness with the messenger who spoke to him on Mount Sinai. And we've typically taken that messenger to understand <clears throat> to be the, the, the angel of Yahweh, which would we understand would be uh, perhaps a pre-incarnate uh, reference to Yeshua. Acts 7.52, though, reads, and 53 reads, Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who, were, 
who before announced the coming of the righteous one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who received the Torah as it was ordained by messengers, <coughs> but did not watch over. This, of course, is Stephen talking, but I believe it's Stephen talking in this, in this passage. And so it's, again, Stephen's understanding is that the Torah was ordained by messengers, which would, would probably nest well with what uh, Paul wrote later in uh, Galatians 3.19, and it was ordained through messengers in the hand of a mediator, which is, again, what we read that Jewish tradition would agree with that, that, ordained through messengers in the hand of the mediator, of a mediator, and that mediator would be Moshe, and the ordination through messengers would be the same as deliverance through it, and I would think that would be, you know, in line with what Jewish tradition would read in uh, by by Steve in Acts 7 and by Paul in Galatians 3.19. We also see uh, extra canonical books. Ju the book of Jubilees reads this way. And, and I'll just read the, the highlighted portion. And the angel of the presence who went before the camp of Israel took the tables from the divisions of the years, from the time of the creation of the law and the testimony of the weeks of the Jubilees, according to the individual years, according to all the number of Jubilees. Continuing now. According to the individual years from the city of the new creation with the heavens, and the earth shall be renewed and all the creation according to the powers of heaven and according to all the creation of the earth until the sanctuary of the Lord shall be made in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. And all the luminaries be renewed for healing and for peace and for blessing for all the elect of Israel. And that, and that thus it may be from that day and until all the days of the earth. So go back one slide. This is talking about, you know, essentially it's a, a future time where that all of Israel, all, all the world know that the God of Israel and the father of the children of Jacob and the king on Mount Zion for all eternity and Zion and Jerusalem shall be holy. So it's a, it is in fact a prophecy, but it's based on the angel of the presence idea. Because uh, it says in the beginning of this, and, for, and he said to the angel of the presence, right from Moses from the beginning of creation till the sanctuary. So talking about the angel of presence is talking about these, these uh, things, which is, the, sort of the angel that delivered the uh, the tablets, perhaps, is what it's talking about. And those tablets being delivered in the future as well to, as it says, for all eternity. So we pass Jubilees and then to Hebrews 2, verse 5. reads, For it is not to the messengers they subjected the world to come, concerning which we speak. So this... The world to come in the Hebrew text is Olam Haba. You might, might recognize that phrase. Um, Olam Hazeh is the current age, and Olam Haba is the world to come. And so, according to this, the Olam, the Olam Haba is not subjected to messengers, but that would indicate that the Olam Hazeh, the current age, is in fact subject to messengers. The text doesn't say it, but we can, by the power of Logic can see that if it is not to the messengers, you see exactly the world to come, which we speak. So in this letter in Hebrews 2, the author is talking about the world to come, the future world. He says that's not being delivered through messengers, as if you look back to what was delivered on, on Sinai, was delivered through messengers, according to what we read in tradition, as well as in, in the book of Acts, and in even in uh, Paul's letter to Galatians. So Olam Haba is not subjected to messengers. So what about this? Can we look at, in terms of looking at the Torah in both the Hebrew text, the Septuagint Greek text, and the Qumran text, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and their versions of this, a basis for angelic administration of the current age, the Olam Hazeh. So there are some differences in terms of some phraseology at the end of this uh, passage, 32.8. He set the boundaries of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. That is, the, that is in the Torah. That is in the Masoretic text of the Torah. In the Septuagint, it reads, for the, to the, the, he set the boundaries of the nations according to the number of the angels of God. And in the Qumran text, the Dead Sea Scrolls, their text of the Torah said he set the, the boundaries 
I'm sorry, he set the bounds of the nations according to the number of the B'nai El, the children of God. So there is, if you look at it, the, the Qumran text kind of has a mixture of the Masoretic text and the Septuagint. Because one says children of Israel, one says angels of God, and, and the Dead Sea Scrolls text says, according to the number of the sons of, or the children of God, children of El. So this angelic administration, you look at from both the, uh, well, really from this text would be the Septuagint, but the children of, of God, in some ways, some, some thought could be that that's what we're talking about. The children of God would be the angelic, the angelic beings there. I would look at it probably more as being Israel, but it, B'nai El could well be understood to be the same thing as the angels. So, continuing on there to uh, Hebrews 2, 6 and 7. The Greek text from, from which the ISR quotes says, but somewhere one is witness saying, what is a man that you remember him or the son of man that you look after him, and so on. So the, uh, the, the Aramaic Peshitta text of Hebrews says, as the Kataba uh, testifies. Kataba, of course, is a cognate for Katav, Ketuba, Ketuvim. So where does this text come from? Well, this quote in Hebrews 2, 6 and 7 is from Psalm 8. Where does Psalm 8 fit in the Tanakh, the Torah, Prophets, and Writings? Ketuvim. It's in the Ketuvim section, right? It's in which grouping does the psalm fall? They fall in the Ketuvim section. So in, in Hebrews 2, 7, you have made him a little lower than the messengers. You have, you have crowned him with esteem and respect, or glory and respect, or glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands. So according to the Greek text, um, this is quoted from this is quoting from um, Psalms 8 verse 5 which reads Elohim here which makes more sense so modern uh, Jewish translations here will read the word Elohim, Elohim here not as Elohim but as uh, as a lowercase Aleph for Elohim and read it as angels. You see here in Art Scroll, and we see it here in JPS as well. You have made him slightly less than the angels. And that's that's how the uh, the Greek text of Hebrews, read going back a slide. Um, but, and so it's really interpreting this in the same way as the uh, the translators in English of JPS and Archibald read, they translate Elohim in Psalms 8 here as being um, with the meaning of Elohim as angels, not as Elohim with a capital Aleph. <clears throat> so the reading of angels or messengers in Psalm 8 is all supported by the Hebrew, uh, the Aramaic Peshitta Tanakh and the Peshitta version of Hebrews, Hebrea. Uh, they use the word malaka there as in translating the word for Elohim or aloha. Uh, and the Aramaic Targumim, as well as ancient Rabbinic sages, Rashi, Kimki, and Ibn Ezra. So the idea that Elohim in Psalm 8 is referring to angels is strongly attested to by ancient sources, is what I would say with that. The translation of Elohim as angels in Psalm 8 is widely, uh, text, uh, is widely understood within traditional Judaism from ancient times. And that's not a translation of, in other words, that's not a later translation error that they were like repeating a word that we later in translation decided meant angels, but at the time that they wrote it, they were using this word that we now think meant angels, but do we know what they meant at the time they wrote it? Well, you'd say, well, what did David mean when they wrote Psalm 8 or whoever wrote right. Psalm 8? Well. Is there a source? Of, is there any sources for of first temple period documents? No, there's no commentary. It's a date from the first temple period. Okay. Even if they use the same word, it still is then when it's translated what it ends up saying to us. But it, that's the fault of the translator, not the fault of the original. 
Right. The word in the original is Elohim, but Elohim doesn't always mean God, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so from Jewish tradition dating back to the time of the, the that that the psalm was translated from Hebrew into Greek and Aramaic, dating back to that would be pre-Second Temple period at least, this would be understood to mean angels and not God himself in that sense. And how do we know that it meant the angels? Well, I'm saying the time that, well, the, the Aramaic Peshitta Tanakh, for example, predates, well, it's, it's, sec, it's priest destruction of the Second Temple. It's not a rabbinic thing. It's it's within the BCE time period that the the, the Peshitta Tanakh was translated, as well as the the Greek New Testament as well. So in the Greek, then I'm sorry, the Greek, like the Greek Septuagint text, excuse me. Angelikos or something, and that we know that that's what they intended then? That's what they understood it to mean, and they're translating it from one language to another. That's what they understood it to mean. Okay, I, I think what you're getting at is why don't we consistently see like Malak or Mal Malakim instead of uh, Elohim. Uh, am, I, am I reading that correctly? Well, I'm just saying, so when we use words, we know what it means at the time. And maybe- Based on context, yeah. If it's somebody coming along looking at it later, they could decide that it meant something else and then they translate it based on what they thought that it meant. And then that gets passed down as what it now is. Well, what I'm getting at is that the translation or the, the writing in quoting the text in the book of Hebrews, whether in Hebrew, Aramaic, or in Greek, they're all in line with the previous translations and as well as the later rabbinic understanding. Because yeah. Rashi, Kimki, and Ibn Ezra are you know lived hundreds of years after Hebrews was written. But their understanding of this passage aligns with the author of the book of Hebrews understanding of this passage in, the, in this quoting from it. So it is, it is not something that is not a mistranslation uh, of Hebrews. It's quoting it in the context of the understanding of what, what the text means, similar to how a Targum translates with commentary from Hebrew into Aramaic. It tells you, it tries to tell the, the author what the text means, not necessarily a, word-for-word hyperliteral translation. So it's not a mistranslation to understand lower than angels or messengers in uh, in, either, in any of these uh, translations uh, of the book of, uh, of Hebrews. So here's a question, then we get to the, the this passage is Hebrews 2, 6, 3, 8. If somewhere one has witnessed, again, that's the, the we're talking about the ketubah. What is a man you remember? Him? What is a man that you remember him or a son of man you look after him? You have made him a little lower than the messengers. You have crowned him with esteem and respect and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all in subjection under his feet. For in, all, for in that he put all in subjection under him. He left none that is not subjected to him, but now we do not set it. But now we do not yet see all subjected to him. So, who is this talking about? Humankind, or Yeshua? It sounds a little like both, doesn't it? It does. <clears throat> what is man or son of man, which? In some ways, Son of Man, of course, is a reference that Yeshua uses of himself, rough going back to the book of Daniel, <clears throat> but it could be either one I'm talking about in this case. I think when we look back at it, it's, it is trying to, it is really, because it's making the case for Yeshua, I think it's really, it could be either one, but I think it's, it's a Yeshua argument here because, because they continues on in verse 9, says, we do see him who was made for a little lower than the messengers, Yeshua, because of the suffering of death, crowned with esteem or glory and respect, that by the favor of Elohim you should taste death for everyone. And so th there are some some variants. We've talked about this already, the the apart from uh, Elohim text, and Eastern, Eastern text. 
uh, two variants are from this text, a variant between Western and Eastern Aramaic uh, text for that. And there's also variants in the Greek texts as well. So we said, we've, we mentioned before, the word uh, is for grace, is substituted for apart from the Western Aramaic versus the Eastern Aramaic texts. So here's some of the, the, the discussion of that. The oldest surviving Greek text, read Hariti by grace, but other ones read Horus apart from, which would sort of, which would align the later text actually align with the apart from, but you don't even really see that in, in most translations today. Most translations look like the, the Hariti uh, text by grace, which would align with the Western text of the Peshitta. Origen, as I mentioned before, Origen, Ambrose, and Jerome quote the Greek text using apart from, which would align, of course, with what we read already in the Peshitta text of Aramaic, the Eastern text reads also apart from. And so we get to chapter 2, verses 10 through 13. I'll just go down to verse 12, which says, saying, I shall announce your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I shall sing praise to you. Well, that's also quoting from the Psalms. And again, I should put my trust in him. And again, see, see I the children whom Elohim gave me. So again, it's quoting from the Psalms and then from uh, re referencing to Yochanan 17, as well as to the prophet Isaiah and to 2 Samuel 22, 3. So all these are being referenced here in chapter 2, verses 10 through 13, particularly verse 12 and 13. So another text from chapter 2, and we, as we read this, are any of the rules of Hillel used here? And if so, which one? Well, I don't know that the answer to the first one has got to be yes, it is mentioned. Otherwise, why would you ask question two? Okay. Well, because if so, which one? It could be a no. Well, what my, my look at it is that it's, when you look at the seven rules here, here's the seven rules on smaller print, hard to see. But cutting to the chase, so to speak. Certainly the first one. Well, it's primarily, in my view, from building of the Father from two or more texts. Two or more passages. Yeah, which would be the fourth rule of Hillel. So these building from two or more texts, we see that uh, in the previous couple slides what the, where those quotes are actually coming from, including um, quoting from Yochanan. Yeah. So continue on to chapter 2, 17 through 18. Starting here at verse, well, let's start, let's start at the, the top of it. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself similarly shared in the same, so that by means of his death, one might destroy him, get might destroy him having the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver those who throughout life were held in slavery by fear of death. For doubtless he does not take hold of messengers, but he does take hold of the seed of Abraham. So in every way he had made to he had to be made like his brothers in order to become a compassionate and trustworthy high priest in matters according to Elohim to make atonement for the sins of the people. So the reference from Seed of Abraham reference is probably from Isaiah 41. And interestingly, in the, uh, in the Aramaic text, it reads Rob Kumreya or great priest or high priest, but it's because, but, Aramaic does have a different word for priest besides Cohen or the, the cognate Kana. It reads as in Kumreya, as in a high priest, but not priest of Levi, of not a Levitical priest, if that makes sense. So Rob Kumreya would be not Rob Kana, uh, which would be the Aramaic cognate for a high priest and a Levitical priest. Rob Kumreya would be a priest, but not a Levitical priest, or high priest, but not a Levitical high priest. So what's Qumran mean? Priest. 
It's an alternate word from priest, but not a son of of Levi. So not of the Cohen lineage. Right. So is this this Samaritan kind of thing that's <laughs> this is a tradition or, or what we call Orthodox Judaism? Well, is, well, the word because Aramaic doesn't is not just a Jewish language. It has other words in it besides Jewish words, if that makes sense. So in other words, Aramaic has words for priests that don't necessarily mean the kind of priest that lines up with you know, a, Le a Levitical priest. Um, but I don't know that you find that in, in, other, in, in other languages, not, not in the Greek text. I think the Greek text uses the word for... So what word was used for Yitro, for example? I don't I don't know from the Torah. So, but so then it wasn't Cohen. I don't think it was Cohen. I I don't know, but I, I, I don't know because he was he was listed as a priest of Midian. We could look that up, um, but it seemed it seemed right to see Melchizedek Melchizedek as being not of Levitical lineage, so Kumriya would fit well with that idea. So cheta is probably recognized that word as a cognate for chata, which is sins. And the text reads, so in every way he had to be made like his brothers in order to become compassionate and trustworthy high priest in matters related to Elohim to make atonement for the cheta of the people. Cheta is, the, as again, a cognate for the word for sins. So the, the question would be, why would Yeshua have to become flesh and blood in order to become compassionate and trustworthy? <clears throat> because it's in every way he had, to, had to be made like his brothers in order to become compassionate and trustworthy. Otherwise, the people could say, our high priest, how can he be fair representing us before Yah? Because he doesn't know our compassion, he doesn't know our hurts, he doesn't know anything about it. He's not one of us. I think you look at it as proof. Uh, it's the proof uh, that I don't have a slide that says or answer the question, but it's the proof that he you know, is compassionate and trustworthy because he did exactly what you what you said. He went through that uh, that he struggle. Was, he was human, mm -hmm. so he knows. Yeah, exactly. Sins, the word chata and chata, you may, I just kind of talked about that. The uh, the Tanakh commentary from Marshall describes chata as an unintentional sin, as sins done inadvertently as a result of carelessness. However, chata and related words are also just used as the general word for sin, but it's also used in the golden calf incident, which really was not just a, an inadvertent sin. It wasn't, in my an view. It wasn't really an accident, yeah. The words the word chata was used there. Well, I don't know. He did say, "Yeah, this oh, came out of the fire. fire. This thing came out, and that's why it's chata." I mean, you know, <laughs> I said, he said to Moshe, "Hey, make that chata, not uh, not a yeah. <laughs> So, is there indication in verse seventeen of any particular biblical appointed time? Yom Kippur. Okay. I, I agree with that. Yom Kippur. Yeah. Question four. Mm -hmm. Who are the people for whom Messiah made atonement? The text doesn't really say, but it could be all y'all, all who are repentant. All y'all. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's just kind of a review of those those questions. Hebrews three. Unless there's something else we want to discuss in Hebrews two. Hebrews two. So Hebrews two, of course, Hebrews three verses two and three. This is from the uh, the PME, the Practical Messianic Edition. Who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was in was in all his house, for he was. 
he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses by just so much as a builder of the house as more honor has more honor than the house. So comment Messiah Yeshua is the builder of the house of Israel while Moshe served in that house. So the builder is always greater than the worker in the house or the servant in the house. Modern Nazarenes, in my view, tend to um, seem to desire to see Moshe a Torah on some sort of equal footing with Yeshua, a problem apparently prevalent in the first century as well. That's why it's being addressed here in Hebrews chapter 3. Uh, my view is there can be no equal comparison between the creator and the created. We should not, we, we often see Yeshua as the word made flesh, which is accurate, but he's also the author of the word. Mm-hmm. So he's not really, a, he's, he's the word of Yah, but I think he's more than a created, if you will. He's not, he's, he is the builder of the house, as the text kind of leads us to say. Just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. And so Yeshua is listed here as the builder of the house, and Moshe is uh, a servant in the house, but the builder of the house has more glory than the house and the one who serves inside of it, or more honor. So read here in chapter 3, it says this, For every house is built by someone, but he who built all is Elohim. And Moshe indeed was trustworthy in all his house as a servant, for witness of, of what would be spoken later. But Messiah as a son over his own house, whose house we are told we are, whose house we are, if we hold fast the boldness and the boasting of the expectation firm to the end. So Messiah built us, we are the son's house. And there is, if you read it in, in Aramaic or in from Aramaic text, the word boasting or glorying is Oshabra. Whereas, and the word for hope or expectation is deshabre. So it's kind of an Aramaic, not quite a rhyme, but definitely wordplay between boasting and expectation. So you see those words together, kind of makes you think, hmm, this is not really uh, an accent. These are, these are that way. So it's Aramaic wordplay, not really a rhyme, but wordplay, I would say. So interesting, the ISR is in this passage is basically quoting from Psalm 95 and in verse 11, where it says, if they enter into my rest. So let's go back to the story. It says, therefore, the set apart spirit says today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tried me, proved me and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was grieved for that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways, as I swore in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. Dot, dot, dot. So that goes on. <coughs> so this is a quotation from Psalm 95, verse 11. Here's a translation from the same passage that says, they shall never come to my resting place. Most translations read of this read as the JPS does. But the Hebrew text actually uses the word "im," which, of course, would translate to "if." If they shall enter into my rest, so this is kind of an anomaly. I point out that most translations translate Psalm ninety-five as it's written by the, it's translated by the JPS. But I said most translations translate Hebrew three eleven as the same way that the JPS translates Psalm ninety-five eleven, from which three eleven is quoted. They shall never enter my resting place, but that's not actually what the psalm says. It says, if they shall enter into my rest. So this could be another another idea of what was the meaning of Psalm 95 at the time, although definitely not a not normally a uh, a literal translation here, but this is I kind of like the literal translation of this text, if they shall enter my rest. So kinds of rest, what kind are pictured here? Well, we and this is kind of for future because I haven't got to chapter four yet, but verse 11, I think, fits into the Sabbath, the rest which believers enter, and also one which remains to be entered into. And we kind of see that listed in, um, in Matthew chapter 11, which reads, Come to me, all you who are labor and are, are burdened, and I shall give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and humble in my heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, for your beings. 
for my yoke is gentle and my burden is light. So this could be this understanding here of Matthew 11 looks like it's something that is now, but also not yet in the sense that all who labor and I shall give you rest currently, but also I think talking about future as well. And so the Shabbat rest is a picture in my view of the rest that remains to be entered into, but it can be also be rested into now. So you can, you can rest on Shabbat, but resting on Shabbat is a type and shadow of a future rest. We'll see when we get to chapter four of the book of Hebrews. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the text again says, looking at it as if, if we hold fast or if we uh, can enter in. Chapter three, verses 12 through 15 reads, look out brothers, lest there be any of you a, a wicked heart of unbelief and falling away from the living Elohim. But encourage one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened by the deceivableness of sin. For we have become partakers of Messiah if we hold fast the beginning of our trust to the end, trust firm to the end. Well, it said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So commentary, if we hold fast in our faith from beginning to the end, we have become partakers of the Messiah. And so in my understanding, the Bible seems to simultaneously teach of the good shepherd, that will not lose any of his sheep, but also the sheep need to hold fast and not wander away. So it really is, we, we are not, we're told here to not harden our hearts and to not, we, we're, we're, we're told earlier to not wander away. And I think that's true. We're, we're, we're to become partakers. We need to hold fast and not wander away, even though at the same time we understand that the, the scriptures teach that the good shepherd, i.e. Yeshua, doesn't lose any of his, his own sheep. So, again, the, if we hold fast, the uh, the text note, uh, I'll read, read verse 18 in the text note. Verse 18 says, And to whom did he swear that he, they would not enter in his rest, but to those who did not obey? So the text note from Isar says, Obedience is the fruit of belief, and disobedience proves that such such a one does not truly believe. The disobedient are not obeying, but that indicates that they aren't actual you know, followers or believers as well, which is a, a tough, tough passage to understand or to take hold of. So this concludes the slides I have for this a week's midrash. What are your questions that we I may have missed in terms of the passages? I'm good. All right, let's pray. Uh, we thank you for allowing us to uh, to midrash on your word, to study your word, to read your word aloud, in in uh, read your word in freedom. Uh, we thank you for allowing us to do that in this country. Uh, we ask you to keep us free and be allowed to continue to, to worship you as we are led. Uh, we thank you for your wisdom and your insight. Yes, to so give us a, a good week. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen.